We need fathers. No matter where you look, to the scriptures, to your own home and history, to the studies that have been done, to the stories that people tell, you can see that God put fathers on this earth because there's a purpose, there's a role, there's a set of tasks which God can bring about through a man that loves God, loves his word, and leads his family. There's a new adaptation of Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book out in theaters now. Many have gone to see it. Perhaps they view it as the story of a boy on an adventure or one who's developing his human skill to try to deal with the rest of the creation around him or one who goes from one tight spot to another to another engaging different ones along the way. But the truth is the original writer of the Jungle Books, Rudyard Kipling, lived in India. When he was five years old, he was sent away to a boarding school. And from that time on, he yearned for, he longed for, he sought after the presence of his father. So as he wrote the Jungle Books, every figure in that film, including the python, the snake, was a male and was one who was teaching and showing and leading Kipling the way. One author said that that's the subtext of everything he wrote for children, that he couldn't even talk about boys without pointing out the need for the father. Two families recently demonstrated the role that dad plays in the nurturing and developing and training of children. The reason I put a circle around Bruce's head, number one, because he's so good looking. <laughs> but number two, so you could see him where he is having just baptized his daughter, Lisa. And then the other night at camp, there's Jamie beside Mason and all the family gathered together. These share in common the fact that they're at every worship service, every Bible study, so many activities and ministry opportunities. And these young people can see in their fathers and their mothers the love of the Lord, a sense of priority and purpose and zeal and passion. So every moment for these dads is a teaching moment, no matter what the scene may be or what the setting Believe it or not, our culture is asking the question, do we really need fathers? In the July-August 2010 issue of Atlantic Magazine, the author Pamela Paul answers that question, probably we don't need fathers. It's the quality of parenting that matters, not parents' gender, dad's income or skills or just the presence of another person, but not dad himself. Two women could do just as well, perhaps even better than a male father and a female mother. You see, in order for this movement to succeed in our society, fathers must be removed. The leadership, the example, the role that they demonstrate raising up boys and girls in God's ways must be set aside and as marriage is turned away from, so dads are seen as unnecessary and optional. And yet the fact is the evidence points, all of it, to the opposite conclusion. It's been said that parents are the windows through which children first see the world. That's true, isn't it? Their view of themselves, their life, their home, the discussions that take place, that's the lens, that's the glass. And in that light, everything else appears. At the same time, fathers reflect the Father. And the Bible talks about this over and over again. In Psalm 103, as a father has compassion on his children, so God is merciful and understanding toward us when we sin. He's mindful of our frame that we're but dust. In Matthew 7, 9 to 11, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, which one of you fathers, if his son needed food, would give him a scorpion or a stone instead? How much more your Father in heaven will give good gifts, the Holy Spirit, to those who ask him? In Luke 15, it was the father of the prodigal son, waiting and watching and longing, then running to throw his arms around that young man when he sought to come back. In Hebrews 12, 5 to 11, speaks of earthly fathers disciplining us 
according to what they understood to be best, but God disciplines us according to what He knows is right, that we may share in His holiness. So dads are the picture. Dads are the first step. Dads are the first one to wear that name, that then that child will come to see the Almighty God in that light. Think about the scriptures with me for a moment. The statutes that note the priority of this important arena of life. God chose Abraham to command his children to walk in his ways in order that God might keep his promises to that patriarch through the generations that would come. Deuteronomy 6, teach your sons diligently when you rise, when you walk, when you lie down at night. Let these words be always on your lips. 1 Samuel 3, Eli, taken away from his leadership because he did not rebuke his sons. He was accountable to do so. Fathers, raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Do not exasperate them. Overseers, deacons, leaders among God's people are to be those who are each the husband of one wife, able to manage their own children, having those that believe, because it says if one cannot lead and direct his own family, how can he rule and govern the church? We mentioned Hebrews 12 as well. I want you to turn now to Proverbs and think about the whole book as a manual for fathers. Whether you've had a godly father or not, every one of us would agree that that's what every family needs. In this great book, we see what our fathers might have taught us, could have taught us, and that which we want to pass on to our own children. I just thumbed through chapter 4. Norman read the end of it for us. But here are the precepts for us to tell and make clear to our sons and daughters. One, to be sure what we're giving is sound teaching, good precepts, that's which healthy and biblical and right. The good things from our own fathers that we can then pass on so that those coming next will understand. The priority of wisdom to exalt you and guard you and crown you. To live long and prosper that didn't first come from Mr. Spock, but from the Word of God. You won't stumble. You'll be in the light and not in the darkness. Don't give in to peer pressure or go with the crowd or do what everyone else is doing or promoting. Choose the light, the path of righteousness. What I'm telling you, put it in your mind. Make it part of your meditation so that you'll never forget it. Guard your heart. From it flow all the springs, every issue, every matter, every decision. Watch what you put in, what you feed, what you live on, because that determines what you will become. Look straight ahead, not to the left or the right. And when you do, you will walk that way. Keep it between the lines. And you'll arrive where God wants you to be. Fathers, that's what we teach our children. What we show our children. What we attempt to live before them as well. So many elements of research have vindicated what the Bible has said all along. And so as we're talking with our neighbors about the gospel... Whether we begin with the Word or we begin with what we see around us, the conclusion is the same. God was right all along. I want to talk with you about three of these in particular. And if you'd like the details, let me know and I'll be glad to share them with you. The first one is, why kids need their dads. It's in parenting.com. And it shows the simple connection between involved dads and successful children. In fact... They're more likely to be emotionally secure, confident in new situations, and eager to explore their surroundings. They're more sociable. Toddlers are better problem solvers, have higher IQs by age three if their fathers are involved. They're more ready to start school. They can deal with the stress of being away from home all day better than children can whose fathers are less involved. At school, they do better academically. 43% more likely than other children to earn mostly A's and 33% less likely to need to repeat a grade. Girls with involved fathers, higher self-esteem, 
Teenage girls close to their dads less likely to become pregnant. Boys show less aggression, less impulsivity, and more self-direction. And children of involved fathers are more likely to achieve higher levels of education, find success in their careers, higher levels of self-acceptance, and experience psychological well-being. And when they become adults, the odds are great they'll be tolerant and understanding, have supportive social networks, and long-term successful marriages. Studies have shown it's not necessarily the big trip or the large expense or the once a year activity that dad does with his kids, but it's the in and out, ordinary, ongoing meals and talks and visits. It's those things that dads do with our kids every day. And we don't have to be exceptional dads even so-called average fathers, however you measure that, if they show an interest in and attention to and give affection to their children, the payoff is tremendous. How do mothers and fathers differ in their approaches to the things you see before you? Well, playing, for example. They're unique and complementary to each other. Fathers encourage competition, independence, and achievement. Mothers encourage equity, security, and collaboration. Which of those qualities matter? Every one of them. Well, in playing, the father's hallmark is physical play, characterized by arousal, excitement, and unpredictability. Mothers, on the other hand, more modulating, less arousing in their play. In fact, this article was written by a woman. She said, I tried to play with my kids while dad was away, and they said, Mom, you never tickle us. I had to take a page from my husband's playbook, she wrote. Rough housing with dad can teach children how to deal with aggressive impulses and physical contact without losing control of their emotions. Dads, this study shows, more likely to encourage risk the mother more protective, which is so important. The dad ready to help the young ones stretch and strive and go beyond where they currently are so that they can face their social environment. Fathers tend to stand behind their children, say, go for it. I support you all the way. Mothers tend to stand in front of their children, wanting to keep eye contact with them at all times. Father's protection is so significant. In fact, it's the absence of fathers that so often can be connected with children going where they shouldn't, being with people and facing temptation that the father might have seen and guarded against. Discipline. Mothers discipline more often, but fathers with a firmer hand. And so for that reason, Dad has a special spot to fill. Gentle, kind, yes, tender, open, and available, but ready to lay down the law and enforce the consequences of disobedience in a special way. Then there's another source, the Father Involvement Research Alliance. I thought I'd read all of this to you today, okay? This is put together by a secular agency in Ontario, Canada. It's not done by believers in the Bible per se, but rather, one might say, just starting with societal needs. It talks about cognitive development. I think we've already noted a good bit of this. Children of involved fathers demonstrate more cognitive competence on standardized intellectual assessments more likely to enjoy school, have positive attitudes about it, participate in extracurricular activities, and more likely to graduate, less likely to fail a grade. Career success, occupational competency, better educational outcomes, higher attainment, and psychological well-being. Emotional development and well-being for infants they're more likely to be securely attached, better able to handle stress and strange situations, more resilient in the face of uncertainty and change. And on and on it goes. Higher life satisfaction, less depression. Greater tolerance for frustration, superior problem solving and adaptive skills. See dads, maybe we count more than we realized. 
Young adults with nurturing, available fathers score high with self-acceptance, personal and social adjustment, and then social development, positive peer relations. Be well-liked by their friends. Less negativity, less aggression, less conflict. More reciprocity, more generosity, more positive friendship qualities. Physical health for children as the father cares about the well-being of their mother. And therefore, from the time the child comes into this world, and even before, the father's watchful eye is caring for his wife and also for the child that's born. Infant mortality rates. It's amazing. You could put this on a graph, and you could show this morning the correlation between the involvement of fathers and infant mortality. There's so much to present, we simply can't cover it all. And then there's a note here about the effect on the father. That whatever he may give, it all comes back to him, multiplied, in terms of his own enjoyment and fulfillment and satisfaction of life. You know, our world encourages so much selfishness. People say they don't have time for children, they're too much of a burden or an expense or whatever. God knew all along that for a man to have a wife and be the father of children is the richest and greatest and most blessed experience that a man can have. And so today we salute fathers. We need you. We need you in the family. We need you at work. We need you in the culture. We need you in the church. Can't we see the correlation between effective fathers and church leadership? That the one who would shepherd, who would be a pastor or overseer of the flock, must first be one who is a dad. And it was demonstrated in the laboratory of the home, his priority and what his life is all about. As fathers grow, the church grows, leaders arise. The gospel spreads, and the impact of the light and salt of the gospel is multiplied through fathers. And then the Heritage Foundation has a piece as well, Why Fathers Matter. Notice youth delinquency, much less likely when dad is on the scene. Substance abuse greatly reduced incarceration, imprisonment rates knocked down. And the religious involvement, isn't it fascinating that when a dad is in the Word, in prayer, in worship, in study, in missions, in ministry of any kind with their children, the impact is immeasurable. That's what studies show. That's what the statutes of God's Word show, and it's also what the stories show. And I'm thankful to those of you that were willing to share something about your dad that I could pass on for all of us to enjoy and appreciate today. Mary Hoffman Carl. Without my father, I would have missed watching someone depend wholly on God. He faced his challenges with God's help. He was passionate about God and came to know him through reading his word. He brought people to the Lord that others simply judged behind their backs. We only found out about these conversions after my dad passed away. Isn't that tremendous? You can see that in Mary, can't you? Chris Carrillo. Glad to have Chris back with us for this summer. I've never met my real father, Chris said. But my uncle stepped up and filled that role better than I could have imagined. Without my uncle, I would not be the man I am today. He helped to raise me when he didn't have to. He showed me what unconditional love was by being there for me when my own biological father wouldn't. Whenever we talk about fathers, there are those among us whose father was absent deserted the family, divorced the mother, went off to do his own thing. 
And then someone else may have stepped in in your life to be an anchor, to be a rock, to be a guide. And that's what happened for Chris. Love the story that Debbie Etheridge shares. Thank you, Debbie. She said, I didn't do well in math in the fourth grade. My daddy usually gave us a dollar if we did good, so he still gave me a quarter for trying so hard. As a child, that told me I was still a worthy person. I did well the next year thanks to his positive attitude towards me. It shows. And then Christy Fair, whose father we all know and love and miss, Teddy Knowles, my father was a true family man, completely devoted to his family and my mother. Christy talks about the vacations they took, especially the last one, to Alaska, when her father's health was questionable, and yet he made the effort. She said, my dad was so nice to everyone, I watched him and learned by example. He was even on a first-name basis with the workers at McDonald's that we frequented often. He was a remarkable and special man, wasn't he? And his influence lives on. David Hurt said, we didn't have much money growing up, but my dad taught me that there's always someone who has less and needs our help. I've been doubly blessed. My father-in-law has been a father figure to me as well. Of course, he's talking about Bob Houston. He had to put his own dreams on hold and drop out of college to take care of his family, waiting decades to finish his college degree. He taught me what it really means to sacrifice for his family. Thank you, David. And then these next two are connected because Erica Rogers Rasmussen, she talks about her dad, our own Malcolm. The word unconditional love. Growing up, he was my best friend, biggest support, my spiritual guide, never judged the mistakes I made in life, always there for my every need. Now a grandfather to six kids who adore him. My only son was named after him. Family means the world to him. He still talks fondly of his own mother, father, and six brothers. Just the thought of my dad makes me forever grateful for him and incredibly proud of him. Love my dad. Well, we heard from dad, too, about his dad. Isn't that great? Malcolm said, my dad's my hero. For over 25 years, he cut cedar fence posts most of the time with nothing but an axe. When he first started his business, he slept out in the open on a mattress covered by a tarp to keep out the moisture. Many days, he would wake up almost covered by snow. He cooked his food over an open campfire. At night, his hands and arms would throb because of the swinging of an ax. Not one time in my life did I ever hear my dad complain. He always remarked that a man who didn't take care of his family was worse than an infidel or unbeliever. I loved my dad. He was my example. He showed me every day what honesty and character were. I never went hungry or without shelter. My dad, my hero, I love you, Papa. My own dad from Nashville, Tennessee, met my mom during World War II in Paris, Texas. On a hot August night at their wedding ceremony, the minister said, wilt thou, and my dad said, we all wilted. <laughs> my dad was not a Christian, as we understand the scriptures, but through my mother's patient influence, a year after they married, they were back in Nashville, and my dad was immersed into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of his sins, became an elder in our home church, for 28 years, a Bible teacher. As to his profession, he sold life insurance. And his card said, Ken Collins, special, ordinary agent. That was my dad. Oh, there's not just one thing in his life that stood out. It was in the day by day, moment by moment, occurrences that my dad showed me the Lord. I'll never forget early one morning, I couldn't sleep. It seemed like it was 5.30 or 6. And I went down to the breakfast room and there was my dad sitting with his Bible open, spending his quiet time with the Lord. 
And my dad recorded major sections of the Bible in his own voice with a little cassette machine that he had. When my father's obituary appeared in the Nashville, Tennessean in 2003 in May, it was relegated to the B section of the paper. You know what the main headline was on the front of the Tennessee on that day? June Carter Cash dies. I think they had that backwards. I would have put my dad on the front. Now, my dad was a pretty good singer, by the way, as June Carter Cash was. and My dad also played saxophone. I don't think she ever attained that. My dad used to play jokes on people. At Christmas time, he would put a gag gift under the tree, and he would say to Corey from Craig, my brother. Never was from Craig. Always from Dad. Ridiculous, outlandish, crazy. But the thing that gave Dad away was his handwriting. We always called it Martian. It was a block kind of script. And we'd pick up, oh, this is for you, Corey. And I'd look at it and say, Dad. He played tricks on his secretary at work. In fact, he called her, pretending to be the telephone company, and had her move farther and farther away from her phone while he whistled. Then she could come back to the phone and tell him if she heard him. She never knew who it was until my dad left a bag of bird seed on her desk. Only at the funeral did that secretary tell me the rest of the story. She said, didn't your dad tell you about the day he fell asleep in his chair and we took a rope and tied him up? I said, dad never told me that. In addition to many of you, I have precious memories of my father. He was in a hospice facility the last night he was on earth. And we were all gathered, my brothers, my mom and I, and other family members, Tanya and others, and singing and praying. And the last thing he ever said to me was, Corey, I'll see you in heaven if I don't see you here again in the morning. My dad had his favorite recliner. Do you have a dad like that? And beside it, he kept a legal pad. When he passed away, we took that and copied it and shared it with everyone in the family. He had a list of his blessings. He had a list of the talents God had given him, of his weaknesses, problems he wanted God to help him overcome. His favorite songs, my dad continues to teach us how to live and how to die. But I heard from many others. If you go to the blog, you'll see not just our own brothers and sisters here, but people from all over who've responded with some memory about the dad. You say, well, how would that help me? I don't know these people. Well, you'd gain something, as I have, from hearing their stories. There's a father we all need, of whom at best we dads are merely a reflection. And he makes this promise, I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. We appreciate so much those who have adopted children into your homes. Every Christian is an adopted child of God because of the sacrifice, the atoning death of Jesus. And so he says, I'll dwell in them, I'll walk among them, I'll be their God, they'll be my people. But he calls us to come out from this world, from its midst, and be separate, and turn away from unclean, things that are sinful and wrong in his sight and begin that relationship with child to its father. That happens when one confesses Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, turning from sin, then that person having died to sin is buried in water. It's called baptism. And then up from the grave, that one arises to begin a new life because of the blood, because of the grace, because of the love of Jesus Christ. If that is your need to be baptized, or if you have some other need, won't you come? Let's stand and sing.